Are there any open seats? Anyone we need to wait for? Hey, uh, just a couple matters of quick business. Um, first of all, I did get a call from Impartner's legal team. Apparently, we're not giving away Mark's Porsche 911S. Uh, apparently, it's a ride in Mark's Porsche 911S. And there was an asterisk on it that says, customer pays fuel cost. So, uh, so anyway, it could still be really cool. And it is Miami blue. And it is an S, which is awesome. Um, also, I wanted to let you know, uh, Maria had uh, some time set aside for Q&A that we ended up uh, running out of, but she is around and she'll be here over lunch. If you have questions, she's here and she's happy to engage with you and answer um, some of your questions. Hey, I'm excited to introduce to you our next speaker. Uh, he just arrived from Barcelona. In fact, I think I hear him moving around back there still. So, uh, so he just got here. Uh, Jay McBain, an accomplished speaker, author, and innovator in the IT industry. Um, his, his team sent me through um, some, uh, some of his accomplishments, but the, um, but the printer ran out of paper uh, after a few pages, so I only have a few of them listed. Um, 2021 Channel Influencer of the Year by Channel Partners Magazine, Top 40 Under 40 by the Business Review. As you get older in life, it's easier to become the top whatever under whatever, like I'm in the top 80 under 80, which I think is you know, really cool, uh, and more recognitions than I can possibly name. Jay is often sought out for keynotes and thought leadership and future industry guidance. Um, Impartner has frequently turned uh, to Jay for insights into our strategy and our product direction. We consider him one of our more trusted advisors, and he's never let us wrong, although his pick for the Toronto Blue Jays to win the World Series this year is looking rough. Uh, Jay has spent 28 years in a career in various channel um, executive roles in sales, marketing, and strategy. Uh, Jay is currently the chief analyst for Global Channels at Canalis, the world's leading analyst firm with a distinct focus on channels, partnerships, alliances, ecosystems, dot, 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 and smartphones. But the, but the first four things are really good for us, so we love that. Uh, we invite you to experience this future forward presentation featuring Jay McBain, Chief Analyst of Channels Partnerships and Ecosystems of Canalis, for an engaging session where he unpacks the um, progression of the channel ecosystem this year and beyond. Um, here we go. So, Jay, are you there? Jay, can you hear me? It's looking good. Give it up for Jay. There he is, right there. Jay, welcome to Salt Lake City. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to have you here. I honestly, uh, you would never get me to teleport in one of those things. Uh, I saw the fly too many times. I know what happens uh, when you teleport back and forth. Yeah, I, I heard your introduction, and I'm just a little worried. Am, are you still going to give me a Porsche for doing this speech? Uh, yeah, it's yours when you get here. Hey, um, listen, thank you for taking time. How was the, uh, how was the show? We had some questions and confusion uh, from some of our attendees because they were still seeing your LinkedIn posts from Barcelona as early as this morning. How did you get here so quickly? Well, I mean, other than, uh, you know, advances in teleportation, uh, we're, we're coming a long way. We're, we're well beyond the metaverse now at Impartner. The metaverse. We figured out what Zuckerberg still is struggling with. Jay, listen, I'm going to turn it over to you. We're so excited to have you here. Take it away. We're all yours. Well, thank you so much. 
So I, I wanted to start kind of a holographic keynote with some joke about transparency of research and things, and I, I couldn't figure it out, and I, I know most of you, and I know you would see right through it. All right, I will laugh. I'm sure people are laughing, and, and we'll have to break for laughter, but I, I want to jump in and say how excited I am to be here and talk about, you know, really all the, the trends that we're seeing in the global channel and things that are impacting our business today, things that we should be planning for for next year, and then maybe have a little bit of fun looking ahead three, five, maybe even ten years. You know, metaverse language here uh, uh, for a little bit of it. So again, thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a lot of fun. And uh, you know, I want to start at the very top. Last year, there was $94 trillion spent in global GDP. Here you can see how it kind of broke down by country. But more interesting to us, is how it lands. 75% of world trade goes through others. It goes through in every industry, around every geography. It's through third-party channels. And that's the way we've run commerce well before the computer industry since the start of time. And back to the fur trading days from my uh, Canadian roots to, to other things, this is how we look at the world. You, you talk to your neighbors and friends. You bought your last car from a dealer. You bought your last TV from a retailer. You bought your last jar of peanut butter. By the way, that joke fell very flat in Europe. They don't eat peanut butter here. Everybody looked at me confused. From a grocer. And that's kind of how commerce works. Then your neighbor says, well, listen, I, I bought a Dell in the 1990s direct. Well, you say back to them, well, Dell just reported $104 billion in revenue, and they're now 58% indirect. Well, I bought car insurance from Geico. Interesting. Geico now sells more insurance through agents and brokers than direct. So this is the story of almost everything. In our industry last year, we look at the $4.3 trillion in technology, for example, that was bought by businesses and governments, and 73.3% of it flowed through third-party channels. This is a very big industry. It's a growing industry. For many partners, they're outgrowing their vendors and their distributors. So this is a healthy industry as well on multiple layers. So that being said, what are we looking forward to? What are some of the things that are happening? And how do we gauge how we look at channel programs, how we look at channel organizations and people, how we look at processes and workflows, how do we look at the underlying technology, and how does this all come together so that we can figure out competitive advantage moving into the marketplace. So of the 11 trends, and I've talked about this one for a while, and it's a five-year prediction that was work done by Accenture. By the way, it was done, and we're at the end of that period, where 76% of CEOs think that their current business model is unrecognizable, and the number one reason was ecosystems. This started the conversation about the decade of the ecosystem. Now that finally at the top, the board, the C-level, the CEOs, we're talking our language. That we, no matter what industry we're in, could be selling pharmaceuticals, we can be selling cars, we can be selling manufacturing products, we can be selling financial and insurance products, it doesn't matter. In this world, we can't do it alone. Every company's becoming a tech company and becoming a tech company means you have to be good in partnerships. So guess what, at the end of this period, we think now that Accenture undercalled this number. Almost every company in every industry, in every country, of every size, is going through a transition, a transformation, some level of change in terms of their customers, their products, and how they go to market. And that change has come into this room with all of us and me uh, a little bit further away. But let me give you an example. So an auto industry that's you know, very large in size, you know, a $5 trillion industry. There's 62 major manufacturers. There's 365 kinds of cars that you can buy. So what are we hearing now that this industry is being disrupted? By the way, they're being disrupted by a computer company on wheels. So the CEO of a major company in, uh, in the U.S. is out talking in public about channels. So we're, we're thinking about a new go-to-market. We know that the world's going electric. 
We know places like California are forcing us by 2035, we're not going to be able to sell uh, an internal combustible engine. We know that 17 states have followed this. Where I am in Europe is way more aggressive. In China, they're there now. So this world is going electric. So these companies are obviously forced to change, but it's not just putting batteries in cars instead of gasoline. It's a world where there's no inventory. It's a world where the pricing is different. It's more direct than ever before. It turns into self-driving. It turns into, at some point, transportation as a service. And how are dealers gonna work in this new world where Tesla is now the North Pole, the, the North Star of how all this works? And this is what you're starting to see. You know, we want people to buy the F-150 uh, truck, which is the largest selling uh, car or truck in America for 42 straight years, we see them ordering them at home in their bunny slippers. And I don't know how many F-150 drivers actually wear bunny slippers, but this is what they see, this is what they're saying on TV. You know, you're going to buy your next Mustang, you know, at home. And, you know, in terms of dealers, you know, that sales model, that customer success, all that stuff kind of moves more direct. The inventory goes back to the plant. It's all built to order. And even further along in these self-driving cars, at three in the morning, it's going to know when it needs new tires and new brakes. There's no fluids to change. It's going to drive itself to some big factory out by the airport, run by kind of minimum wage Amazon employees or robots that are going to get it new tires. That car is going to be back by the time you need to drive to work or, or go somewhere. And you will have not known, other than the smell of new tires, this thing. So these uh, comments in public are having an effect. If you know in your local geography, dealers are pretty rich, pretty important people. Generational wealth. They've been around 100 years. So their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents might have owned these dealerships and moved them down. So guess what? You know, these are people that run the local chamber of commerce. They get senators and congressmen elected. And some dealers are more powerful than the actual manufacturers that they sell for. And now they're freaking out and they're wondering about all this expensive land that they live on, these expensive employees that they pay for to do things that are now changing. This is an automobile example of what every industry is talking about at a very senior level now going forward. So these are the best-selling books now on Amazon. The subscription consumption economy. This direct-to-consumer, which I just mentioned in cars, but from a B2B perspective as well. Usage-based and value-based models. Looking at product-led growth. If you happen to be a software company today and you've raised money, your private equity or venture capital people will be pushing you into a model and reminding you that Slack got sold to Salesforce for $27.7 billion. Zoom, through the pandemic, you know, went to the stars, and all these other companies, product-led growth is the right way to do it. And that doesn't sound like a channel model on the outset, but we're going to kind of change that going forward. And then obviously the growth of marketplaces, which we're going to get into. So that's the business model conversation. If I go back to technology from cars, you know, Cisco, a $50 billion company, has committed 100% to subscription consumption, hardware, software, and services. You know, a week or two later, Michael Dell, that $104 billion I mentioned, committed 100% of that to subscription and consumption with Apex. By the way, a few weeks ago, just reported that Apex grew 78% year over year. Very small baseline, but that's growth that is higher than the hyperscalers and some of the biggest, fastest growing categories in technology. Old company I used to work for, Lenovo, with TrueScale. Company I worked for before called IBM that sold off their services, managed services and outsourcing services to Kindrel. And now with Red Hat and AI and other things are 100% committed to as a service. These are big revenue lines. HPE has actually been at this the longest. Interestingly enough, GreenLake has been out for about four years. And in that time, in the last three quarters, they've registered triple digit growth. So this isn't off a really small baseline anymore. They're growing at double to triple AWS, Google, and Microsoft selling as a service hardware. 
The server isn't a million dollars anymore, it's $9,000 a month forever. So your company might be thinking about a subscription consumption model. We need to think about the channels, the programs, and the structure on how to do that well. And so the next thing you learn quickly in a subscription model is for 40 years, we've been focusing on the partners at the point of sale. Everything comes down to the exchange of money. Those people out there in the local, hyper-local places that are collecting money on behalf of you and then somehow servicing those clients. Well, we know this is a McKinsey study that there are seven trusted partners at every mid-market and higher enterprise company in the world. There's now seven people that hold influence and hold very high value for what they deliver. The average vendor, I believe sitting out there in the audience, recognizes one or less of those seven. And this is what we're starting to talk about. This exploding, and I've shown a Venn diagram before, but it keeps getting bigger every year we build it. There are now millions of partners, partners like on this uh, right side, that are shadow channels, what I used to call you know, years and years ago. They're not in the shadows anymore. You know, 200,000 digital agencies, 78% of them are now tech services companies. Well, guess what? Their buyer, who's a CMO, is spending more money on technology than the CIO. You know, a big system integrator like Accenture, who makes a business acquisition every seven business hours, has bought more digital agencies in the last 18 months than anyone else. Going after this buyer, going after this opportunity. You look at every company's becoming a tech company, every professional services firm behind them are also becoming tech services firms. 81% of accountants, I could go down the list. On the left side of this chart, you're seeing an explosion of different kinds of influencers in those early moments of a customer journey. You're seeing, for example, 800,000 emerging tech companies. IoT, AI, automation, blockchain, quantum, metaverse. Uh, you could go into self-driving cars and drones. Whatever future you're talking about, which is today's technology, there are upwards of a million companies that are gonna com be competing next year to get into one of those seven or more uh, trusted partners. You have 175,000 software companies. You don't just buy a SaaS tool, you end up today buying seven layers. Every hyperscaler deal today is seven different layers. Every SaaS deal is seven layers. And every security deal today is seven layers. The buyer is shifting into this model where they see the building blocks to get to an outcome. And part of those building blocks are software, part of them are hardware, and then a big part of them, six dollars for every dollar, is services. So this is the world now where we have millions of potential partners. They show up at different parts of the customer journey, and we're starting to get better in terms of recognizing programmatically and coverage-wise and recruitment-wise and incentive-wise of how to work with this large set of partners. If you have a thousand partners today, you need 10,000. If you have 10,000 partners, you need 100,000. You just take your current audience and probably multiply by 10 is the right number to address those seven partners in the room. So you start to think about the size and scale of this. And you know, I'll use an example that I usually do, which is a couple of weeks ago, if you happen to attend Dreamforce in San Francisco with Salesforce, Mark Benioff you know, gets up on stage, talks about Ohana and the ecosystem and all these great things. But more importantly, they had a plan four years ago to recruit 250,000 partners. They just hit that plan and doubled it. They just announced they're going to 500,000 partners that they're recruiting. And then you take a step back and go, well, I thought Salesforce is direct. Well, they are. You know, in the US, they're about 100% direct where they get 73% of their business. They're opening up a little bit of resale in Asia Pacific, but how could a direct company recruit 500,000 partners. Well, in the time I've spent in the Salesforce Tower, they've done the math, and they've done all their products in the categories and multiplied that by seven. For a SaaS company that you know, satisfies a couple of buyers, that's how big their target channel is. And again, it's completely separated from the point of sale. So then we start to look at partners. If I need to recruit 10 times the partners, there's no way that I can phone them, nobody picks up the phone, I can't email them, nobody picks up an email. So you start to look at these watering holes. What do they read? Where do they go? 
who do they follow? So I need to capture, if I want to go to digital agencies, I could work out a 14-sphere influence plan, catch them at the point or the watering hole of where they get smart, capture them through the influencer super connector that has the platform in front of them. These are new ways to talk to audiences at large. And you know, if you're recruiting MSPs, you can see the math. How many 85 magazines and 143 social groups? These are real numbers, and I've listed all of them. But in this world of a 1,000 watering holes, there's a top-down approach where you can fly and go meet with the top couple hundred MSPs. But to touch the other 76,000, you go to where they go, working with the platforms they trust and working with the people that have earned the right to be in that room. It's a top-down, bottom-up strategy, and for most vendors we work with, it's missing. The next thing is a buyer that's in constant flux. In four years, the majority buyer in B2B will be a millennial. We have, obviously, a whole set of demographic things we could spend this whole session talking about. Firmographic changes, which I've already talked about. But you start looking at that psychology, the behavior, the journey they're on, and you start asking yourself deeper questions about how my buyer actually works. Whether it's in a traditional model or a subscription model, there's changes afoot. So now we know more than we ever have about a buyer. And the easiest way to explain it is just to go back to that car example. The last time you bought a car, at least the average of you, spent 28 moments before you ever hit the dealership floor. You know, you watch videos, you read magazines, you went on social media, you talked to a neighbor, you talked to a friend. I mean, you went through all these moments. A little bit later on, you know, once you narrowed down those six, 365 kinds of cars, you went online and configured, priced, and quoted it. You colored it, you put on your rims. I mean, this is a later journey moment. And then later than that, before you hit the dealership, you downloaded the invoice price, you downloaded the back-end rebates, you are smarter than the salesperson ever would be. You're smarter than the sales manager because you know within $100 what you're walking out with. And you're at this point like, do I have to spend eight hours in a dealership? Or can I just order online and you know, have a Carvana thing, just drop it and give me the keys? So this is the moments where people get smart in every considered purchase. You're buying software, you're buying security, you're buying a manufactured product, you're buying a mattress, it doesn't matter. The average of 28 moments and we're going through a major change for every one of your CMOs. They can't buy this data anymore. The end of the cookie, which Apple has already taken away, and Google is about halfway away from taking it away. Those two companies own 99% uh, mobile share, about 86% desktop browsing share. Those two companies kind of own the cookie. When the cookie finally goes away, I can't just go buy the moments and import them through MarTech or AdTech. I have to, it's now a partnership problem. I have to go make partnerships with as many of these 28 owners as I can. The person that wrote the ebook, that recorded the podcast, that ran that event, the association. I mean, I gotta look at this and figure out that I'm touching my customer as many times as I can during those 28 moments, hopefully getting endorsed all the way along. The entire marketing journey has become a partnership challenge. If you wonder why Impartner acquired Amplifinity, if why they acquired Thai Kinetics with some exclusive Google technology, why they acquired News On Demand, these acquisitions are around these 28 moments. They're not at the point of sale. They lead there, but how you can invest in these different things is important. For all those companies going into a subscription consumption model, the actual point of sale is the first 30 days with the customer. It's just the first $9,000 of that million dollar server. It's a different model. By the way, if you buy that on a marketplace, 24% of marketplace transactions today, out at Microsoft, AWS, Salesforce, HubSpot, Oracle, wherever it happens, 24% of those are done by partners, clicking buy on behalf of the customer. Even though they don't collect the money and they're not producing as a reseller, they're literally pressing the button and they own kind of the layers that get, uh, that get done. So the fun then starts. Every 30 days forever, I have to drive adoption. 
I have to drive good implementations and good integrations to get stickiness, upsell, cross-sell, enrichment. These are the things now that are measured in this new world. A lot of these new programs and point systems are rightfully pushing more money post-sale because that's where Wall Street is watching companies. You know, we don't care how much Netflix sold. We kind of care how much Netflix new subscribers there are. And we want to know that they're holding on to those subscribers with 108% retention. Which means for every one they lose, they got to double up a current one. So it's rethinking channels across those partner points and customer points every 30 days forever. So we then look and kind of model this up a little bit. So if there's 20 different partner types, you can't just keep in 30 and then 40 and then 50. You can't just keep building programs for partners. I have an MSP program, I have a SI program, I have an ISV program over here. I have a, you know, you can't keep doing that. So what you've got to start looking at is the swim lanes your partners are in. And another reason you don't do that and why I created a Venn diagram, not just a list, is that no single partner does a single thing. They don't stay in their lane. They might do two things, three things, four things. They might show up at that point of influence before that point of sale, that 28 moments. And they probably do because that's what gets them business later on. They show up at the point of purchase, point of sale. Whether they take the customer's money or not, they're showing up still in all different facets. Even in a direct sale, they're there. And then at a point of expansion, every 30 days forever. You start mapping your partner types across all these three parts of the customer journey and thinking about a customer for life, thinking about the seven partners they trust, it's a different way of thinking about channels. And then you add in all the technology alliances, the integrations you're doing, the APIs, the SDKs, all this integration work. And it's another big channel, uh, strategic and business alliances. It all needs to come in one program, one front door, with a lot of really nice furnished rooms inside the house. And a company like Accenture, which yesterday reported they had 721,000 employees, it's the largest tech company in the world by employee size, they are Salesforce's biggest influence partner, biggest land partner, biggest expand partner, technology alliance partner, they've written a thousand lightning bolts and lightning flows, biggest strategic and business alliance. They're actually number one on all six categories. So you can't just build a program for one company, call them an SI, because they're literally walking in the front door and there could be 700,000 people that are trying to find their way to the right room. This is the importance of PRM. It's the importance of through channel marketing. It's the importance of all of these things that we're talking about today. So let's talk about some of the things that are changing that you know, might a year ago, two years ago at MPartnerCon, uh, in the metaverse last year, I made some predictions. Well, they're starting to come true uh, almost day in and day out. So you're hearing now about companies that are getting rid of their gold, silver, bronze programs. Not just one or two, but you're starting to hear a little bit of a flurry. You know, the biggest one, the one that we would all recognize, at least our partners would all recognize, is the biggest channel in the world dump their gold and silver tiers. It's all points. And how they built these points, how you get to 70 out of 100, where the decoder ring is, well, to simplify it, they took most of the money out of resell and they've redistributed today to expansion. Two thirds of those 70 points sit post sale. And there's a reason for that. Now, I spent a lot of time in Redmond talking about this. They have outgrown AWS and Google for 10 straight quarters with their enterprise army of partners. You know, 400 new partners join every day. They're obviously having success getting that initial 30 days. So they're putting the juice on the expansion, on that adoption, on that stickiness, on that customer for life, which they think to Wall Street, you know, could make them the second most valuable company and maybe that could make them the most valuable company. Maybe that's more valuable than Apple who just sells hardware, you know, devices and, and software and things. So that's the play. And right now, you'll think that if a couple quarters go by that they're not outgrowing AWS and Google, somebody holds the decoder ring, will probably start pushing points earlier in the journey. But they've got the tools now to move around their gross to nets, the front and back end margins, into places where they can pay for the point of value instead of the point of sale. 
And I think you'll see that theme today is pain, recognizing, measuring, monitoring, managing the point of value a partner has, or multiple points, instead of that single point of sale. That's the biggest transition we're going through as we speak. In about a month or so, VMware is going to be into a full point system. You're seeing small SaaS companies like Smartsheet. Like I said, though, every day you're going to start to see examples. HP, in the event I was just at, was making some hints about a full point system. And you're starting to see this actually grow outside of technology and into manufacturing and other places as well. The next thing is we're starting to see some leadership changes. And this one was shocking. I, I knew that you know, there's new skills here. There's you know, probably multifaceted skills that just goes beyond kind of what a channel chief, uh, a coin-operated sales quota-based you know, job every quarter, you know, nailing the numbers. But it's surprising to start to see you know, companies like Microsoft put in a chief partner officer. You know, a company like uh, AWS putting in a chief partner officer. A company like Google, chief partner officer. IBM, chief partner officer, to spend that billion dollars on the ecosystem. So you'll notice three out of the four of these jobs have been women. And in the 20 chief partner officers now globally that have been assigned by large companies, it's over 50% female. There's another interesting thing about these chief partner officers. Not one of them yet, across the first 20, have ever shown up on CRN's channel chief list. The channel chief of today is not getting the promotion into the C-suite, not reporting to the CEO and making a million dollars a year. The companies have chosen a lot of people from McKinsey and Bain and Boston Consulting. People like very, very smart, but that have no channel experience. But that's on purpose. The channel chief now reports to the chief partner officer, and they run their swim lane, and they make their numbers every quarter, and they run their programs. We've known that for 40 years. But that is now one of six vice presidents that report to this new chief partner officer. We're starting to see a second change, which again is a really interesting change. For 40 years, the head of channels, the channel chief, would build an empire, a silo. And the Harvard Business Review came back and said, you know, a channel chief looks more like a CEO or a general manager. They don't look like the head of sales or head of marketing or any line of business. They're not see a bear, shoot a bear people. They're more strategic. They're more multifaceted. They built their own company within a company. They have marketing and sales and operations and finance. They have everything contained. And for decades now, they've been on this race to build an empire. So you've got this case where you know, we're hiring tens, hundreds, thousands of camps, sitting out on the silo, a little bit friction with the sales teams and friction with the marketing teams, and in theater, it's tough to manage and things. Well, what we're seeing in ecosystems now, these new 20 leaders, you're starting to see a world where they have new KPIs and new organizations. So from a KPI perspective, you know, looking at these people, talking to them, they're not incented on revenue and profit and customer sat. You know, three pretty important things to a business. This is their incentives. Co-innovation, value creation at the customer side, one plus one equals three, network effects. If we can't do it alone, if we can't go forward alone, no matter what business we're in, I need somebody incented across the partnerscape, the partnerverse, and making sure that they're hiring in the right people to make sure that we're looking at all six of those swim lanes. So as those people are hiring, they learn something very interesting about building silos or building empires. They've embedded their people. And this is smart, because they learned this from data science. 10 years ago, the CTO, as they started hiring data scientists, they weren't out to build an empire, because they were reliant on cooperation with every other line of business. So all the data science team did, the CTO, was embed them. You report to the CMO, you report to the CRO, you report to the VP of customer success, you're in products, you're in operations, you're in finance, and now they're reporting into the line of business, dotted line back to the CTO. Over the course of a few years, this trust that was built, the data lakes that started to fill up, were company-wide. And now marketing got access to sales data, and, and finance teams got access you know, to sales pipeline data, and you've got product teams who are building go-to-market strategies from day one, 
because they got to see each other's data. And so in partnerships, if I could embed people in marketing and sales and customer success and product and then have them dotted line back to a chief partner officer, we're going to do better marketing if those 28 moments, everyone's sitting in the room together. My direct marketing team is trying to win three or four of those moments. Hopefully they configure the product on our site. Maybe they come to our e-commerce site. Maybe they read our e-book. But if not, I've got people in the room that are going after the other 24 moments. In my sales team, really the money coming in, if it comes direct, if it comes through a marketplace, if it comes indirect through another marketplace, if it comes through a resale channel, in the end, we just need the money to come in. And I want to make sure that my head of revenue has the people in the room that can support all those motions. You know, every 30 days forever, more of that's a partner play than it is just customer success managers phoning up customers to keep them out of jeopardy. And products, you know, building your products with routes to market, go to market, built right in. This integration first, API first economy has to happen from the first line of code on. Very interesting. Bunch of dotted line people now as partnership leaders. I talked about marketplaces. Here's the change. I, I talked to you last time about this bump that we saw in the pandemic. The first 33 months in the pandemic, we saw more than 10 years of growth combined. Well, as analysts, we're looking at, okay, many countries were post-pandemic. So what's happening? Was this a plateau? Are we going to come back to normal? Are people going to return to their old behavior? The answer is no. If you look at all the big consumer uh, categories and you look at what you know, considered purchases are, they keep growing. We're actually coming out of the pandemic and quarter after quarter after quarter for the foreseeable future, we keep growing this thing. It's getting bigger and bigger. At Canalis, we had this you know, view of a $25 billion cloud marketplace economy by 2025. We got it wrong. Calling 56% growth wasn't aggressive enough. We've actually refined this now into the triple digits. This is going to be a $50 billion economy by 2025, and it keeps growing faster than that. Enterprise credits, we're seeing all kinds of activity that are driving this new material. A few weeks ago, we saw in Microsoft's earnings that they reported that they have several customers now that have committed to over billion dollar commitments to their marketplace. When they don't quite reach those numbers, they're going to ask to extinguish those credits with services, with hardware, with other stuff. This is now a distributor who is kind of a bank that's holding a lot of this power. So, you know, I've shown you this before and kind of how it's shaping up in the middle. You know, there's going to be 20 marketplaces that probably take on about 80% of that, you know, 40 of that 50 billion. We're seeing interesting things happen. There's 150 marketplace development firms out there that will help you put out a marketplace and e-commerce and things like that in your, in your site with your company. But companies like Miracle here in Europe raised $555 million last year. You know, AppDirect stateside is raising hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, a small company, Vendasta, up in Saskatoon, Canada, raised $120 million last year. So you're starting to see the top five separate from the pack. Like every other SaaS category, you always get into kind of this top five conversation. And now who picks up that other 20% is going to be in this world of marketplace development firms who can build a marketplace for a buyer, an industry, a geography, a certain product, a certain segment of the market like SMB. They could build it for a service model like MS MSPs, managed services. So you're starting to see how this is all going to work, where the other thousands of marketplaces are going to be picking up the long tail. And so we also know that last year, a big change happened since the last time we got together. The fees that marketplaces charge have dropped. So Microsoft dropped from 20 to 3, Google followed, AWS followed, the SaaS companies are starting to drop. So guess what? When marketplace taxation is 3%, that's the same as a credit card swipe in consumer, all those companies, including you, that have 20%, 30% gross to nets, what you would have paid on front and back end margin, now only 3% of that is getting taken away indirectly. You still maybe have 17% or 27% to furnish your program. So for all the great things that you've built in incentives and motivation and loyalty and education and training and certification, all the great work you've done in and partner can now be translated over into your marketplace activity. It's more than just private offers now. It's the future 
of one of these major routes to market. The last thing I'll say about marketplaces, McKinsey came out with some crazy numbers recently. They think the ecosystem economy is going to be 70 trillion by the end of the decade. I began by saying today's economy, world economy, is 94. So literally this whole world economy we see today will be furnished through ecosystems. That's why we're going to the decade of the ecosystem. But they made a second call in that, if you've actually double clicked on the report. They think $17 trillion is gonna flow through B2B marketplaces. We're not talking Amazon and Alibaba here. We're talking B2B marketplaces is gonna drive what today would be 20% of the world economy. Just fantastical numbers. I think they're a bit high and a bit aggressive. However, this is an established route to market. It's a growing route to market. We're seeing company after company. You know, Zscaler just reported 500% growth in marketplaces. CrowdStrike just reported 650% growth. You know, this is off the charts for some of the early adopters who have a solid marketplace plan. The next thing is the embedded economy. And so we had talked a long time about these future of not being SKUs. They're embedded building blocks, seven layers of the deal. And the example I always use is a company I worked for for 17 years. You know, not too many people know for 29 years straight, IBM has been the most innovative, inventive company in the world if you just look at the patent race. Every year they win it. And you know, the reason we don't know that is for every quarter, for the last 10 years, they've dropped in revenue. They haven't monetized a nickel of this invention and innovation for one pretty simple reason, which the new CEO kind of picked up on quickly, is these aren't products. We don't send them over to distribution, get our 400,000 salespeople to go sell them, skew them up and ship. These are embedded. 10 years ago, instead of selling Watson to cure cancer, they should have been selling Watson into Salesforce so they didn't have to build Einstein into Tesla, so you have a little uh, Watson inside sticker on your car. Sold it to your toothbrush manufacturer, so you have your Watson inside your electric toothbrush. This is the embedded economy. AI is not a product. Actually, any of those products in emerging tech, none of them are products. They're building blocks. And they're not sold in a linear way. And this is the story of ecosystems. One last point here. Integrations are becoming the number one way people buy products. So in the MarTech stack, where there's 9,932 companies competing, you see on the left, you may not see, it's pretty small. The first thing people consider before price and support and service and all the normal things is integration. How well do you work in my environment, inside my stack? You see in the other SaaS marketplaces, the same thing. It's now number one. We just ran a survey a few weeks ago, closed off with 800 channel professionals. I partnered with HubSpot and partnership leaders to do it. And the number one people, way people buy software, and this probably is new to all your in-partner colleagues in the room right now, the number one way they're going to buy in partner in the future is how integrated it is. Not how powerful, not how many feature function benefit. I want something that works in my bigger stack first. Let me bring it back to cars, the Ford problem. 79% of people today buying a new car won't buy it unless it has Apple CarPlay, that little iPad that sits in the middle of the screen. Well, Apple CarPlay 2 goes from window to window to windshield. It takes over your speedometer. It's your interface. It's the UI UX for the next car you buy. 79% of customers will walk out of your dealership if you don't have a technology alliance with a certain company. That's kind of a painful lesson for a car industry that's over 100 years old and is $5 trillion in size. Always think integration first. Your company's probably in a similar situation or will be in the next few years. We're seeing a big battle in distribution. I wrote a report last year simply titled, Are Distributors the Future of Distribution? And you know, a couple of things that came from that. One is the biggest tech data cynics, the biggest distribution uh, merger ever creating a company twice the size of Coca-Cola, twice the size of Nike, three times the size of McDonald's, got delayed by two weeks because of this report. All these trends that we're talking about are headwinds, and the company had to come together and figure out how they were going to transform to make this happen. They're getting new competitors that only ship bits, not atoms. 
They don't own a warehouse. They don't own supply chain. They don't have capital credit facilities. But they know how to make a seven-layer stack. They're competing with tech or telecom solution brokers, uh, technology solution brokers, who used to be called master agents. So there's all kinds of competition coming in. And what they are forced to do at this point is no one can hide in an ecosystem. For 40 years, they've been hidden. My kids have never heard of these big distributors, and they're bigger than every brand that they know well. Well, that's because in a customer, in those first 28 moments, there's certain uh, big elements of demand, of, of um, importance that distributors play, that they have to be visible. Nobody hides in an ecosystem. And for many of these executives who've been in distribution for a long, long time, this is about the hardest thing to come out from. The second thing, which is really expensive, is they have to build a platform for distribution. When I used to sell PCs, I'd send them 12,000 SKUs. I would load up at, at the end of every quarter, so we made our numbers. But they'd have to sell that out to 75,000 bars. I mean, pretty simple equation, and it was human-based. When there's a million software companies, millions of emerging tech companies, and uh, 35 million customer solutions, millions of partners, you know, start adding that on a calculator, you get to an error. The point is a platform for distribution is digital first, and it's going to be able to do all of the things, hardware, software, and services, to drive outcomes. This is a big task, but they're investing billions of dollars to do it. So I've got two more uh, in the last couple of minutes. One is the language change. You know, chief partner officer, seven partners at every customer, you know, new buyer. You've got all these trends, and now we're starting to see the language change. You know, when six of those seven partners don't care what your margin is, because they never collect it, but they still care about getting trained and educated and building competencies. They still care about co-selling and co-marketing. They still care about 97 of the 100 elements of your program. So how do you change the language to talk to the other six, other than going to their watering holes, which might be different than your core channels? Well, you start talking in multiplier language. Two weeks ago, Mark Benioff always kicks off Dreamforce with $6.19 for every dollar of Salesforce is generated by others. Extra software, six more layers, extra hardware, and the most of it, two-thirds of it, is all services. So they're listening, and they don't have resellers. So if somebody comes up and says, how can I make 20% on a deal, they stop talking. If somebody comes up and says, how do I make 200% on a deal, that's their favorite kind of partner. HubSpot, $5.80. This economy, again, is direct, mostly, but it's this economy where they're integration first type of, um, they're, they're integration first on their uh, technology, and they're recruiting all these digital agencies, and they're moving. Google Cloud, $5.70. So we're starting to see categories of where these multipliers are. You know, we're seeing big numbers out of Microsoft, every single product they have, but more importantly, the CEO is out talking this language on TV, in big keynotes, in front of Wall Street. We're generating trillions of dollars for the channel. And guess what? None of that is margin. We've actually extracted a lot of our money from the actual point of sale, and we're redistributing it. But the real eye on the prize is that six, seven, eight, nine, ten dollar number on every one of our product lines in the future. And I'm going to end here. So there's a whole set of innovation in partners leading a lot of this innovation in 11 different categories of innovation, but this continues to grow. When the MarTech stack last year, uh, 10 years ago had about 223 companies, today they have 9,932. They have a buyer who spends more money on technology than the head of technology. So we're going on a similar curve where it's now a $4 billion industry, integration first, so how does Impartner work with every one of these islands? Even if they're in an island, do they work well with others? Because a customer's tech stack may look different in every iteration. So in this new world of you know, a $4 billion market, there are a number of these companies, including Impartner, that raised $3.1 billion last year in private equity. Wall Street is starting to believe in the decade of the ecosystem. Obviously, all the companies, everyone in attendance here believes in it, or you would have not flown to Salt Lake City. I would not have beamed in. But this industry is growing fast. There's technology leadership. We in this room have programmatic leadership to do this. We have the organizational leadership. And then in the end, we have a capture of these trends. So we're going to come out of this faster than our 
competitors. We're going to face these macroeconomic headwinds, and we're going to have the play to drive things forward. Thank you very much. You're all, you're all twisted. Go, go back the other way now, just to un Okay, thanks. <laughs> Jay, you're amazing. You're amazing. I thought the cool thing about the pitch was going to be in the box, but, uh, but your message is so good uh, and, and resonates so powerfully. As my digital native colleagues would say, OMG, that was really good. So thank you. Well, I'm, I'm, really, I'm, I'm really trying to think outside the box. <laughs> Uh, I was going to actually Ooh. say to the team, nobody puts Jay in a box. <laughs> I, I would tell you I'd be back Thursday, but I think it is already Thursday. Hey, listen, what I heard uh, and that I loved was, um, well, first of all, a lot of the forward-thinking companies that he's talking about are, are here today and customers of ours, TD Synex, Zscaler, Lumen, Smartsheet, and more. So, so we love that. We love hearing that. We definitely sense a shift in our customer base away from that more traditional distribution model, which we still support and we still love doing business with, but into the building blocks. In fact, I'll just say this. Um, for those of you that, that sat in Gary's uh, deep dive presentation yesterday, uh, really, all, in all seriousness, if you don't understand, I know this is really product centric and I apologize, if you don't understand our custom object and the implication it can have on your business and how you build an integration stack, please book time in the Brain Lab, talk to Gary, talk to Trevor, talk to some of our team, because it can be transformational. Tra transformational? You know what I mean, you know what I mean. Do you know what that means, transformational? I'm not sure. I'm going to have to research that. All right. If you feel like I kind of feel that the go-to-market model that we've embraced for so long is kind of shifting underneath us and, and that you need help navigating that change and planning for it and executing, we have great partners that can help kind of coach you through that. JSG, other groups have the ability to help kind of coach you through some of these transformational changes. Please take a moment during lunch um, after our panel, take a moment during lunch and this evening to go over there and spend time with them. Uh, we totally want you um, to feel like this is something that you're comfortable with. Um, all right, we're going to have, uh, you okay hanging around for a little bit longer? We're gonna, we're gonna pull you into a panel, does that work? That works, this is gonna be fun. You must be getting tired of standing. Well, if you could uh, send over a leather chair, that would be great. John, can we get a chair over to Barcelona ASAP? All right, let me bring up uh, Christine Stewart of the Lexington Group. She is going to introduce our other panel members. Um, we'll bring Jay back out of the box and have him join the panel. We love questions from the crowd. Uh, I just want you to recall that as you've seen, there is a little bit of a lag when the question is going to Jay, so, uh, so just be prepared for that. But um, Christine, you're introducing your panel members. I am, thank you so much. Over to you. I appreciate it. Wonderful seeing Jay. I've seen him in a lot of different scenarios, but not quite this one before. So I'm gonna have my folks come out here and join me. We're moving Jay. Hi Jay, oh, 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 he's upset with us. It's like going into lightning round. It's nice to see so many familiar faces. It's uh, even more nice to see so many new ones and people that I've learned to meet at uh, other events or certainly in social activity this uh, past uh, pandemic period of time. So I think you guys have all read the topic that we're talking about. Just a, a very brief history on it. When the Channel Chief Advisory Board that works for and partner got together at the beginning of the year, we had a discussion about what did we all think everybody should put forward what they thought would be the top topic that we thought that our partners, that our clients, our vendors, that the, the, the world at large wanted to hear about in this space. And across the board, I think 100% it was ecosystem. So here we are. Uh, about two months ago, we released a paper called Ecosystems, the New Partner Imperative 
And I think you're starting to get wind of that in the last two presentations. So what we wanted to do was provide you with some amazing thought leadership looking at this from a variety of angles um, to kind of dig down a little bit deeper into this and maybe answer some questions. We're going to leave uh, time, maybe like about eight minutes at the end for each of you to ask some questions. There'll be some roving mics, so we want to leave time for that. So uh, quickly, we'll just get into the group here. Maybe. Yeah, you're there. Oh, no, you're past it. Oh, there we go. Right, so uh, again, Christine Stewart, Lexington Group. I have a channel consulting firm. I've been doing that seven or eight years. My past is working at a lot of different countries, uh, companies just like you. Uh, I worked at Cisco for about 13 years, got into this in seven years, and absolutely fell in love with it. And you can probably imagine why, because I get to work with a lot of great, smart, cool people and a lot of changes in this world. So um, what I'd like to do is introduce very quickly my group. On my far right, I have Cassandra Golston. She is the CEO and founder of a company called PartnerTap that I, uh, in my personal opinion, uh, thinks was quite a bit ahead of their time. Thanks, Christine. And I just want to say thank you to Impartner for bringing us all together. We've been a longtime partner of Impartners for the last four years. And Chelsea, thank you on the marketing team for getting us all in person. PartnerTap, we are a data sharing application. We help with account mapping, pipeline sharing, and accelerating co-selling for your ecosystem. Thank you. And to her left, we have Jared Golston. Jared, uh, some of you may have just become aware of. He is the CEO and co-founder of an organization called Partner Hacker. Hey, I'm Partner Khan. Happy to be here. Um, if you haven't subscribed, we have Partner Hacker Daily, which is a seven day a week newsletter. It's a horrible idea, but there's <laughs> about 5,000 people and it has a 50% open rate every day, seven days a week. Um, so we're a media company covering the era of the ecosystems and i um, happy to be participating in the best time to be in the roles that you all are in. If you like provocative in the panel, you got it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the most controversial person here. We'll see if we can make some friends. We're going to skip this guy in the middle because I think we all know who he is and we all know and love Jay. So I'm going to move to, well, here's the deal. So I originally uh, did not have Janet on this panel and I thought to myself, Christine, what the heck are you doing? We've got one of the smartest folks uh, attending the conference and here and, and a friend of mine uh, who knows one heck of a lot about what's happening in the ecosystem and can participate with us. So Janet Shines from the JS Group. Well, first of all, right back at you and everybody up here on the panel. And Jane Michelle says, could you bring home some gifts for the girls? Um, just <laughs> wanted to give the wife update to Jay. Um, and I'm Janet Shines. I lead the team at JSG. We're a group of channel consultants that are a little different. We've all carried the bag, done the job, had the beating up from the senior executives, and we really pride ourselves on actionable insights and how to really help you to enable your channel to succeed and quite frankly take more than your fair share from the competition. So I'm really looking forward to having that discussion about the ecosystem. Thanks for having me. And I'm trying to get one last move on the slides. And after lunch, you're going to see Christy. One more? Well, there, that's the one. Perfectly. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. And, and uh, Jay, I just don't, I know we need to keep moving because I don't want to keep you from going to uh, Barcelona Beach, which I know is absolutely fabulous. Mm -hmm. And there's probably some lovely tapas at some little fun spot on Barcelona because I've been there before. So we'll, we'll keep this moving for you. When in Barcelona, they don't eat till midnight, so I am actually good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you probably have a siesta involved somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay, it, it so... It might come in about 10 minutes, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. So the first question um, is gonna be focused around, we've heard from Maria, we've heard from Jay, we've heard from a lot of people, right? You're hearing it uh, quite a bit about this kind of new decade, new era, new, you can call it whatever you want about ecosystems. And I'd like to just ask each of these folks, I think Jay has shared with us, but I'm gonna ask these other folks just really quickly, kind of what's the number one they see happening in their business and particularly with their 
clients and the people they interact with that says, this is the time for this ecosystem's discussion? Yes. Well, what I'll say is, you know, the decade of the ecosystem, what we're seeing is an explosion in automation around partner technology. You know, we're seeing it uh, two days ago, we were in uh, the partner day for Impartner. There's so many partner tech companies building in this ecosystem. And what that is doing for all the companies in this room is really bringing automation to fuel growth. Um, and so we're gonna see 10X the growth that we've seen in the past. And we really need that today, now than ever now than ever, especially in the market that we're in. Agreed. Jared? It's not a great time to be a CMO or a CRO right now, is it? I was talking to the CEO of a um, about $150 million consulting firm, and it has sales in the name. They have 96 clients in the Fortune 5000, and 100% of them missed their number last quarter. What the heck is going on? Yeah. And I think companies right now are recognizing more than ever that whenever you're building your operating model in your walls, we've gotten too myopic. We have cheap access to new customers through advertising, through social media, through all of these different things. And then we pass those things from marketing to sales, and then we expect these service people and customer success to implement it. What people are realizing is the funnel isn't working anymore. Building inside of your own walls with this myopic model of here's how I put things in and I get things out. You actually need to build in market outside of your walls. And that's what an ecosystem is. An ecosystem is comprised of communities, which are individuals that have a shared professional interest, like all of you here, and then partners, which are accounts with a shared commercial interest. And then I believe media content, yeah. things that we're doing right now, are what connect those two things. That's an ecosystem. It has nothing to do with your operating model. And I think that's why there's so much pain in the C-suite right now. Thank you. Janet, I know that you have uh, been experiencing this and talking about it for a while. I'd love to hear your opinion. So the first thing I would say is we're very lucky to be here at the Impartner event, and Dave and the whole team, and Joe, thank you, because we're having these conversations. And the thing is, the game changed. And we can all say, oh, my game hasn't changed. I'm still playing basketball and everybody else is playing hockey. But the reality is the game's changed. And if you're not playing the ecosystem game because of your own internal organization inequities or the, the lack of vision from your CFO because he doesn't want to pay for co-sell or any of these other things, get help. Get someone to come in. You're in partner customers. We have a phenomenal relationship at JSG with InPartner. I'll come in for free for an hour consulting call and I have never lost against a CFO. And I will tell you sitting here that the biggest problem you've got with implementing everything you're going to hear at this event is going to be him or her. So learn the financial metrics of what actually matters in an ecosystem-driven world. Enable those financial metrics. You are the plumbing, you are the foundation that's gonna be built on, that's gonna empower this future ecosystem. Learn it, understand the cost of it, and learn to fight for it. Because if you keep playing the wrong game, you will lose, and then it'll be you who everybody's staring at to wonder why. Thank you. You know, Jared, or, uh, Jay's been sharing with us um, a lot about just kind of the changing uh, environment uh, within people that have ecosystems, titles, and ecosystem opportunities at companies and finding out that people have jobs actually with chief ecosystem officer uh, reporting all the way at the C-suite level, which I think we all agree with because one of the key things, there's a lot that we talk about, but one of the key things, and I... I learned this at, when I worked at Cisco many, many years ago, is that we kept our technology partnerships slash alliances organization very separated, very separated, and I didn't care for it back then, and it's quite a while ago, from the partner organization. Well, these are the guys reselling, right? And these are the guys that we kind of partner with, and it was really competition. So I think that's a big aspect of it for us getting to the higher level understanding of how important it is and how important the innovation, not just saying that we have an integration, but actually co-innovating solutions. I know, Jared, that you have some thoughts on, you know, this opportunity kind of for the partner organization to make its way through some of the other silos within the company. Well, 
speaking to this chief ecosystem officer point, I mean, that's what I titled myself. That's the cool thing when you start your own company, you can make up a title. So I made it up. Yeah. I was like, hey, this is what we're going to go with. Chief, chief that's ecosystem my title. Officer. That's what we're going to do. Um, but there's a reason why I did that. And I, and I believe in that sentiment of what you just said. It's that um, I think in a lot of ways, what we're doing right now in ecosystems is very similar to economics. And there's this great quote by uh, Frederick Hayek, um, Nobel Prize winning economist, the curious task of economics is to demonstrate to us how little we know about what we imagine we can design. What does that mean as it relates to our business? It means that I believe that's the role of the chief, e chief ecosystem officer, to sit down with the CFO, the CMO, the CRO and go, how interesting that you think our business is gonna end this way next year, and we haven't talked about the market. We haven't talked about our communities, we haven't talked about the people that live outside of our walls, our partners, et cetera. So I think that's the job of the chief ecosystem officer is to expand that field of view outside the walls of your own company into the market and go, where is our ecosystem and what is it, what role do we play? And in to embed partner people within all the other important aspects of the business. So not just sales, because that's been happening for a while, not just marketing, because it's kind of been happening for a while, but also with customer success. Absolutely, like product as well. It, it, it needs to, like, I've been saying, end the partnerships department. Stop channel as a business unit. You need to co-innovate within your own company and bring that to every single department. Um, you shouldn't have people with the same roles in different departments, in my opinion. Agree, and, and I know you talked about this, Jay, a bit in your slide and in the evolution of the bubbles and how many are the transactional partners and you definitely a couple of years ago coined the, uh, coined the uh, trifurcation of the channel which I think at the first everybody was like wow that's exactly what is that and now we're like oh yeah of course of course <laughs> that's exactly what it is how do you see that taking place if I let me ask a quick question of the, of the people here in the audience how many of you have like let's just say reasonably expanded your portfolio of partners to be ones besides your kind of previous ones of non-transactional. How many of you are really looking at affiliates and referrals and partners that are going to need attribution and that kind of thing? How many people in this room? And that's what I thought. Yeah. It's a low number. And listen, I want to say this about everything that we're going to talk about. This takes time. Yep. Don't anybody think they leave this room and like, yeah, I got it. I got that ecosystem thing figured out. I'm going to go get one of those automation tools or whatever I'm going to do. It's going to take us a while. Just like we said in the paper a couple months ago, this is a very complex thing, right? It may seem kind of like obvious. It's a complex thing. It's going to take you time. That's OK. Key is get going. Just need to get going, right? And some of you already are, I know, because I know some of the folks here in the room. So um, back to you, Jay. How, what are you seeing when you're out talking to some of your clients or prospective clients? How many of them are making that motion or at least moving in that direction of getting that broader set of, of partners? And I know that we're starting to see the bubbles change on your chart. Yeah, the first thing I would say is that we're getting a lot of help top down. And so whether you're a public company or a private company, for example, if you're a private company, there's a high likelihood that your private equity company and your board of you know, venture capitalists or whatever it is are out writing blogs right now about ecosystems, about the future of ecosystems and, and how everything is partner forward. So, so that's good. The CEOs, like I mentioned, you know, in whatever survey you read, are starting to get this. And we spent 40 years in channels where no one above us, you know, could spell the word channel. But, but when you're into this modern world, because by the way, channel is a short form for channels of distribution. Yeah. How to get your product to market and how the money changes hands. You know, the reason for the ecosystem, the reason for this new language is we're talking about the six other partners. So we know, you know, whatever product category you're in, whatever industry you're in, whatever country you're in, there's a certain way that buyers buy. And you have to be representative across every one of those layers. If a lot of them buy direct, you have to have a very good direct offering. Marketplace is indirect. But after you're done that equation with your senior leadership team, it's time to have the conversation about the other six partners. Where do they show up? What do they do? How do they influence the customer? What's the rules of engagement? And then at some point, at some point, how do they get us a customer for life? All the metrics 
of what we look at, the cost to acquire customer and these customers for life are actually, as Janet said, much more uh, aggressive and, and, and much more beneficial than doing things in a traditional way. Okay, cool. So now we're going to get into uh, a topic I am like enjoying about and many of you are probably uh, tossing about right now and that's direct versus indirect, right? And it's always been a topic. Um, and we know it's a cultural change, especially for bigger companies, right? You know, the, the sales organization rules the roost, and why shouldn't they? Um, but, but how does what's happening now with ecosystems, with the different types of partners that we have, with the innovation, and yada, yada, all, all of those things, how do we actually see that change being implemented? I want to ask this question first of, of Jared, because there's a lot of debate about, you know, all of the automation that's coming. Um, you know, with being able to, you know, work across our organizations, but how will that also work with just keeping those relationships intact between the organizations and improving them, in fact? And, and, I, and I think I know where we're going with this, that some of the new tools that are becoming available are actually tools specifically to help partner account managers or channel account managers, whatever you call them, work better with their AEs. Yeah, I, I'm not a fan of the indirect versus direct language, and I'll, I'll give you an example as to why even in like B2B SaaS or hyper-growth technologies, Bessemer Venture Partners comes out with every year their state of cloud report. Best, BVP is a top five VC firm in the world. Um, I can also bring up a stat from Andreessen Horowitz, but they said in their 2022 state of cloud report that indirect partnerships are now table stakes from day one. But what they meant when they said indirect partnerships is just not direct, right? That's what they meant. They yeah. meant was, and what's crazy is VC thought leadership is upstream of typically executives. Why? That's how you get fired. That's how you get money. You raise money. Um, that's how you get a raise or you get your next round of funding. Um, and I think the walls are breaking down where I'm seeing executives that are more open to working together than they've ever been before. So I think the forcing function of the market and the timing, um, it's, we, we need to break down the walls between these different departments. And you shouldn't have, you know, uh, partner marketing and then marketing and then partner enablement, like exactly. separate functions that don't talk to each other. To be part of the same organization. Specialization and, is and for And strategically ants, thought insects. through, right? <laughs> right? I mean, and we're gonna go from the time of like people bragging like, hey, we're 100% partner attached. It doesn't always mean the biggest deal. It just may mean that we go out, we've already got a deal going, but then our, we've been told to do this, so we go making sure that there's a partner involved in the deal. That world will change in the next few years, where partners will be sourcing deals, partners will be bringing in leads, and your own internal organization, whether it's marketing on a lead or whether it's directly to sales, if it's like a real deal and a real opportunity, the, your organization will be working with their organization to more quickly bring that deal through the funnel into closure, typically at a higher ACV, typically quicker than you normally would have done it yourself, typically at a lower uh, uh, customer acquisition cost, maybe. And I, I think, Cass, you've seen this as much as anyone because all of a sudden you're able to share partner overlap with the direct team or vice versa, and all of a sudden these conversations are happening that didn't happen before. I think we're, we're seeing some of the walls between direct and indirect in some organizations come down and in other organizations they're still up. But right now more than ever, everybody needs to figure out how do we protect our base, how do we get net new logos, do we have a large enough direct team to go after all the new, new logos, or how do we get all of these partners together and enable the growth that we need to see. Because right now we're gonna be doing it with less people and we are going to be forced to do more than we did last year. And the only way to do that is to enable the ecosystem. And so in some of the most forward thinking companies that have been channel led are, we're now seeing the direct and indirect starting to work together. Yeah, it's, and let's face uh, facts. Yeah. I mean, it's really I to antiquated to thinking to say direct owns the account. Think about how the primary channel sells. Primary channel sells through a bill of materials, right? They go out an MSP, for example, a systems integrator, they go out and they sell an outcome. 
As a vendor, you're selling one little tiny piece of that outcome. Many new vendors, in fact, struggle to get end user customers' attention, and that's why they embrace 100% channel, 100% through the channel. Companies that have been around a little longer will say, no, direct owns these accounts. So the first thing we have to do is say, you don't own an account as a direct, you just don't, I'm sorry. Right, it, this is a, a community collaboration. The second thing you have to figure out is what's the smallest thing you can do for the biggest impact to prove this to people. Because I'm gonna tell you right now, you're not proving to the direct sales VP that he doesn't wanna do, that he doesn't wanna work with partners if he doesn't wanna work with partners, you're not. Right, deep breath, he's gonna go, yeah, blah, blah, this channel is fun. So you need to do the smallest thing for the biggest impact. And frankly, right now, that's influencers. Jay talks all the time about the sphere of influence, but you can enact a new channel program, smallest thing for the biggest impact. I saw how many people raised their hand. Not a traditional referral program, but an influencer program with points and benefits for people that help you influence and get those sales to the team and money if the sale closes. Now direct begins to have a reset of the expectation of what channel is, right? And you begin to tampen down the emotionality. And I truly think that's the problem with this direct and direct thing right now. It's emotional. And we need to understand, we can sit here on stage all day, you're gonna go fight that fight. So you gotta figure out how you kind of back into it. Um, I think that's the best advice I can give, back into it. And I think that that's what a lot of people are looking at, especially if I look at the titles, a lot of people in this room, you know, from an operational standpoint, it's also going to be, you know, how do we think that compensation models will change for our own sales organization? And again, I know from turning a very large aircraft carrier at Cisco, you don't do that quickly, right? right. You slowly evolve Slowly. their plans over the years so because Cisco people any people that have been doing this for a while are used to um, their targets and their plans being in a certain way and it's kind of stressful when all of a sudden you change how those targets work or you share that yeah. and and the implication of that is you're gonna have to double bubble for a while right because of the way that that's gonna right. work and right. that's just got to be part of the deal but, and that's okay that's okay because, yeah. and a bad economy changes a lot of behaviors yeah so in a bad economy, you won't have enough sales engineers, you won't have enough salespeople. You can get away with a lot more. I've run some huge channel programs. You're gonna get away with more because you have this in-partner partnership and the ability to automate and plumb and create these programs that'll work quickly and to compensate for lack of sellers and technical people in the next 300 days than you've been able to in the past 10 years. So use the bad economy to your advantage. And with our time, I'm trying to move us along because I think we've got some other great questions. It also leads right into the next question, which was like KPIs and metrics and ROI. So you listen to all this discussion of these different type of partners and the way that you're going to pay them is not the way you're used to, right? The incentives will change and it'll be about attribution in the non-partner sourced, but in the partner influence, partner assisted types of sales. How are you going to look at attribution? How do you measure? There's companies that have been doing it for a while, as Jay has talked about, with impact and such, but there's also a lot of new companies in, in some of those ecosystem islands he discusses that are looking at different ways to do that. There's a lot of different types of influence. Like you think influence is like maybe one or two things. There's a whole set of categories of influence of you know, they tell you about this company, or it's a common company, or they make an introduction to somebody, or they give you some insight into what's happening in that potential deal, or they reference you, or they actually, you know, provide you SME support and helping to close the deal. And at some point, you'll probably give, you know, different levels of incentives to those different types of influencers. Do you have any thoughts on that at all, Cassandra? One of the, I mean, before, a deal registration happens, there's so much that has happened. Is in front of that. In front of that. And one of the things that we see is we allow collaboration between partners prior to a deal registration. So if you're using the full solution of PartnerTap, you can track all of the touch points that happened between multiple partners and sellers inside of an organization to truly see the influence. All these backdoor conversations, this partner was the actual influencer. Now you have the data to actually prove that influence. Yeah, I think that um, 
we'll have to get over kind of our old school way of looking at ROI. And, and I think that's changed anyway, just because of the pandemic and the, how far the digital transformation is taken to where a buyer is actually interested in buying our products and actually talking to people about them. Because again, they've done all that research you know, ahead of time and such. But um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna segue, because I need to very quickly, into uh, Jay's favorite topic and one of mine which is just this whole tech stack and, and automation. And, um, you know, so we got to hear about some of his, in the last two years, his, his new islands that fit in with some of the previous uh, work with, that he was doing with some of the companies that do various partner ecosystem or, you know, those types of applications and now to be considered flat platforms. And I'd like to say, you know, starting with you, Jay, where do you see of all of those different ecosystems and those new companies which are literally showing up every day, right? Maybe not as quickly as they were before uh, our market changed a bit. Which are the ones that are really taking hold? Which are the ones that people are really grasping onto and say, this is the first pilot I need to do? Yeah, it's a great question because it actually answers your previous question as well. It's actually a technology I that, first by the way. answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> And, and you've got the right people on stage uh, to talk about this. So, you know, when I consider in the past, in those 28 moments, it'd be wonderful if I could use and partner and do a through channel marketing automation campaign. I get to see the click, I get to see the activity, I get to kind of measure, monitor, great. If that moment happens outside of and partner, now the question is, okay, you know, I need to go find partners who generate those moments you know, who recorded the podcast, who wrote the ebook, the association, whatever it is. But now I have other tools I can use. There's a referral and affiliate tool I can use. And that was one of the acquisitions I mentioned that Impartner made. So that's another layer of watching into those early 28 moments. And then now there's another layer. So you talked about impact and there's companies like Partnerize and AWIN that brought from consumer this Kim Kardashian-like attribution software which is like 50% art, 50% science, but trying to predict these moments and, and measure them. But now you've got a wonderful tool like PartnerTap that solves a really big problem early in the journey. So no partner wants to share their CRM or spreadsheet of customers with a vendor. That's something that hasn't changed in 40 years. But if I could send that up to a protected escrow service where it's double blind, and the, my vendor does as well, and I've got a magical tool to do account mapping, maybe sharing of that activity. Now I've layered in four technologies here to monitor maybe 20 of those 28 moments. The company does that the best, that realizes that partner tap plus and partner is one plus one equals three, is gonna be a step ahead of their competitors and it's gonna be giving their sales team deals much earlier in the process, and you know you win deals if you get them earlier in the process. What have you seen, Cassandra, in, uh, in you know, the acceptance, and you've been doing it a while now, of what PartnerTap is doing? Well, I'll tell you, years ago, um, we, we went into a deal, and the partner team, channel team, said, don't tell our privacy and legal team that we're sharing data, because we're sharing it all in spreadsheets, but don't tell them. And fast forward five years later, we're still having those conversations, but we've, we now have so many logos in the enterprise, HPE, ADP, SAP, they all have gone through the privacy and uh, verification that it's okay to do this secure data sharing. And they'd rather be in control of the data sharing to get new logos, to protect their base, to accelerate the ecosystem play. There's no way to scale the ecosystem unless we are data sharing at scale in a secure manner. I want to comment on that real quick too, Cassandra. It's also different when you're talking about account data versus, uh, you know, PII, personally identifiable data. Correct. Like when it's account data, it's like, who are we harming? Whose data are we leaking? We're talking about a domain. You know, it's it's really not that it's not that hard to like get the legal and privacy team on. And I, I often refer to that as second party data. 
Like partner data is second party data, it's not third party data. Third party data, eh, it's a little sketch right now, right? I mean, Facebook lost what, $12 billion in revenue in one day, 270 billion in market cap. It's the single largest stock market drop in world history, by the way, because third party data is dead. Now, second party data though, when you're just sharing account information, it's like, I'll go fight that fight with you in front of any CIO or CFO or legal team. Like, we can share account data. So there's no law against this. There's no privacy regulation saying you cannot share account data. Yes, you can. Yeah, and I think what data you share is really an important point. So a lot of times, and I, by the way, we recommend Partner Tap when we're consulting with people because we know it works, right? And we know it, it offers the right privacy and, and security. But we have a lot of these very dysfunctional conversations first. What are you measuring? So if you're still measuring certifications and revenue and compliance, that's great, but people are complying with the wrong thing. So if you're measuring revenue and certifications, you're measuring rear view mirror metrics. Now we hear in partner at this event talking about Google Ads are now gonna be integrated into their platform. What you should be measuring in a world where Google Ads is available, technology automated, is what's the website value of your partner? Is it going up or down? Are you on their website, yes or no? These can all be automated with kind of little spider bots to gather data. Or is their Google AdWords placement higher or lower? Where do they show up in local search? These are, these are instead of rear view mirror metrics like, like certification and revenue, they're windshield metrics of where the people are driving to. How many deals did they get engaged with the direct team on? How many new logos did they bring? We have to change our metrics and use the technology to allow us to plumb that in. And that's where I've been so excited listening to the Impartner team with these new benefits that they're adding, we can do that. The technology technology can take to, quote Jay, kind of the leading edge here to let us evolve our programs to actually find the people that are driving us towards success. Instead of sticking with the partners we've had for the last 20 years, of which a good majority of them will not be your top partners 10 years from now. And that's really the challenge for all of you sitting in the room as we use the technology, is to use it for that evolution. All right, I'm going to stop it right there because I'd like to give you all some time for Q&A. My understanding was we have some wireless mics out there. Do we have wireless mics out there? Yes? All right. How about just anybody that has a question, stand on up and give me that bad boy. I did you this to see. Come on, you. Oh, there we you, go. Yeah, you've one got up there. the opportunity of these folks in you front right of you. There. You should you should utilize that. Where we got one right out there. There you go. Hi. Oh. There we go. This Come is uh, Landon Scott with Fortinet, and uh, one of the questions I have is who's what is a uh, a recommendation resource for traditional companies trying to change their compensation models to adapt to consumption. I think I'll go to you. Yep. Is that all right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, so first of all, everybody's trying to adopt to consumption, right? So what we need to do first is you need to go back to your framework and say, how does my framework change for the behaviors that I need from a channel in order to drive consumption? And I think when you think about that and you think about how you plumb that answer, it's very different from how the majority of companies, I know your program, are going to market today. And so when we map the behaviors that drive consumption, we can map that into our channel program and then we can automate those journeys. If we don't, we're just kind of hoping that people do con consumption. And I think the key here is flipping how the channel thinks about engaging with us in that very same framework to actually drive that consumption and make more money. The compensation models are gonna change. When the channel makes six dollars for every dollar they sell of your product, we have to change how their view of compensation happens and how our view of compensation happens. And I think you're gonna see some forward-thinking vendors even lean into shared compensation where the partners are compensating back to them for services. So it really needs to be something that we start to think about and change our compensation schema and understand, kind of my final comment that today you probably have a couple for big companies a couple million dollars of compensation gaming happening in your program from your channel have somebody like the team at JSG or someone else here come in find that rip that out repurpose that money to drive consumption I might I might hop on there with a little bit more of a an inverse take in that I think what a lot of companies get stuck doing is they design compensation models to help 
meet company goals. And I would say to invert that, the best programs and communities that I'm aware of, what they do is they go, what do our partners need? How do we help them? And then by virtue of that, what does that mean for our compensation model? Not the other way around, because no one cares about your 10% rev share, your 20% rev share. No one cares. No, no one cares. Yep. Yeah, but no one cares about all it. All right, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give somebody else a chance because then we're gonna have to close up. Where was the other question back there? Right here, over here. Okay, bring it on. So you talked a little bit about um, startups and building out a channel program, but the, the indirect side, direct side, enablement and having them all separate and how that's kind of problematic. Well, it's problematic for me right now and getting everyone on the same page and on the same team instead of butting heads with marketing, right? Like, so I wanna hear from all of you, how would you go about getting everyone, everyone on the same page, getting more channel centric and really thinking about all like together instead of these segmented um, you know, directions and ways uh, to run a business? I'll have thoughts on that, but I'm going to go to Jared if you want, because I know you know a lot about marketing. Where's that friction coming from? Is that friction coming from a plan? Like, hey, here's our marketing plan. We need to generate X in traffic, Y in MQLs, Z in pipeline. Like, where's that friction coming from? And then I would just simply say to invert. And what I mean by invert is those aren't the goals. That's to Janet's point. That's, that's a rear view mirror. That's behind you. That's like... What, what are we doing to get alignment on the things that are completely untrackable? Things like dark social, influence, communities, media, content. What do our partners read and what do they want and what do they need? And that's the thing to get alignment on. Not the thing to get alignment on and how are we gonna hit this MQL number? That's about you, that's not about them. And I think now is why it's the best time to be in channel or in partnerships because guess what? Your counterparts in marketing are hurting. They're hurting bad. Yeah. This has never been a worse time to be in marketing. True, honest statement. The average American gets 400 to 10,000 advertisements per day. That's insane. I can say that 100 more times. So go to your marketing counterpart and go, it's not about how we solve our own problems. It's about how we solve the problems that are created by things like dark social and influence. Help them there. All right. I'll, I'll close that one up. I'll, I'll say one other thing is that you're seeing some companies now that are actually finding common goals that they can set that sales, marketing, customer success, and the partner organization all own. I'm not saying they're the same goal. Sometimes they are. They might be partner sourced revenue. Um, but that they each have, and, and the technology folks. So how many integrations are we doing? How many adoptions of that actual integration are occurring? It's one thing to do an adoption, so it's another after you launch it to see if it's actually, or to do an integration, to see it actually being adopted. All right, so we have a few minutes left. What I'd like to do here, because we promised that you guys would get things to take home, and I hope you already have, but I'm gonna go through each of my amazing panelists here and give them about 30, 45 seconds to just give you, if I could tell you one thing to take home, and then Jay and you and I will go last. So first I'll go to Cassandra. What should they take home? From, what should they go back and tell their teams? Because I know how these things go. When I've gone to these, you get back and you get put in a staff meeting, and it's like, what did you learn in a partner con? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the next generation is it's a different type of salesperson. They have to have a partner mindset. I would say in the marketing department, we have to have a partner mindset. And at, from sales leaders to channel, it's an ecosystem mindset. And potentially the people that we have today in place might not be the people that are right for the next journey. And so we have to think about that. And let's get some revenue. Absolutely. Go download your free version of Partner Tap. <laughs> All right, Jared. I would say end the partnerships department and kill the channel business unit. It's time that we integrate and it's partner led everything. Um, and then if you want more opinions on that, um, go to partnerhacker.com. You can sign up for our newsletter. It's free. You get the Partner Hacker Handbook. It's 100% free. Our events are always free. So we're here to give back and make you all famous, contribute, write, consume. Um, and uh, happy to be a part of this partnerships moment because it's very real. It's never been a better time to be doing what Thanks we're doing. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Of course. Janet. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Culture kills channels, good or bad. Go back, and a kind of partial answer to the gentleman's question in the corner, go back and determine how your culture needs to evolve to embrace this ecosystem. 
one of the exercises we do at JSG with our clients is we look at the framework and how the framework is going to have to change over the next three years. Because this is a long journey for all of you, right? You can't just snap your fingers. And then we write a credo, a mission statement. I'm looking at Scott Jones from T-Mobile. We did that work with the team. And you take it throughout the entire organization. And I actually am so you know ridiculous. I make everybody sign it. This is our channel credo. This is how we're going to work with the ecosystem. These are the promises we will never break. Get that on paper. It sounds old fashioned, it's not. Make that the lesson you take back from here. The channel is changing to the ecosystem. We have to change our framework. Let's get the cultures that are gonna drive that change. I think Jared and I agree on that, that are gonna drive that change to make your organization truly outcome focused, which is channel neutral. Awesome. And Jay, because I'm standing now between you and probably some fabulous tapas, I'd like to get your uh, last advice to all of the folks here. Yeah, if you haven't already, build a team. Build a personal team. Build a community. Build your own little tribe. You know, for example, Janet is my mentor. I learn something every single time I hear her speak. Christine I talk to once a month, and we you know, they're the most wide-ranging conversations ever. Uh, Jared is one of the smartest people in ecosystems. He's running an impressive community. There's 5,000 people going to an event in about a month. I mean, it's somebody you want to hook on to. And, you know, he's tapping into the best minds in the world in this space. And then I talked about uh, Cass and PartnerTap. You know, there's a technology element to this. The decade of marketing was about technology and building that tech stack and building that marketing motion. The decade of sales was about Salesforce and that start of that sales tech. You gotta be thinking about the pilots. You gotta be thinking about the work you can do. One plus one equals three. And every time you're in front of your executive, start to show the tech stack and think the areas of innovation and think how you can take you know, one step further than your uh, competitors. Final thing I'll say is last year's, actually this year's CRN channel chief list, which has 650 channel chiefs on it, now have an average of 2.5 years in their jobs. Before the pandemic, it was 4.3. So if you're looking for a multi-decade career and really build yourself forward, it is your own network and choose wisely. Amen. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Jay. We appreciate it. I'd like to say, first of all, thanks to how lucky am I to get all these smarties on the panel with me. I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate that I, I get the opportunity to talk with these folks, but there's a whole bunch more of you out there, and I know you are out there. I, I'll, uh, a couple of these things have been mentioned. You know, and Alice, they also have a survey that's going to be out in about two weeks that they did with HubSpot and partnership, partnership leaders that's about, you know, partner oper operations and programs. You'll be interested to find that the number one reason that people are buying partner technology today is integrations. And that shouldn't surprise many of you, and it might surprise some. Uh, Shameful uh, pushers. I'd love to, if you haven't read my, uh, my partner imperative paper on ecosystems, give that a look. Um, we've already talked about the Partner Hacker newsletter. I think it's fabulous because it's easy read. It's the one thing that I get, and I get way too much stuff that I read every single day. And he also hasn't mentioned, but PLX Summit, I think Jay mentioned, is coming in November. It's free. There's going to be five days. There's going to be a focus on investors. There's going to be a focus on sales, on marketing, on products. And the last day will be on success. You can sign up for one day or can sign up for all. But it's all free. And I'm telling you, you're going to have some wicked smart people talking to you out there about each one of those topics. Including in partner. Including partner. In partner, yeah. Including partner as a sponsor. And there's an organization, if you haven't come across it, go find out about it. It's called Partnership Leaders. And you can join on partnershipleaders.com. It's very minimal to join. The Slack channel is like nothing you've seen before. You can ask the kind of questions that you're wondering about. 
Nobody makes you feel embarrassed. Everybody's happy to help you. People will DM you. They'll answer you right there on the Slack channel. I've never seen a Slack community quite like this place. So check that out. And then last, if you haven't done it, go get the free version of Partner Tap and start understanding what account yeah. mapping and co-selling really looks like. There's some major stuff out there. You know, Janet and I do similar things and then some things we cooperate on. And I've got various other friends out there that do consulting. Come visit us, come see us. There's a lot to learn about ecosystems. Thank you so much. Awesome, for inviting thank you so us. much. Jay, we let you go already. Um, hey, uh, windshield metrics, my favorite comment. I'm, I'm using that one for sure. Hey, uh, show of hands, did you enjoy that? Yes. Hands up. Okay, you with the hands up. Your lunch is right outside this door. Uh, it's hopefully still warm. Uh, so who didn't enjoy that, hands up? Uh, all right, your lunch is out the door and down this way. No, okay, good. Hey, listen, we're a little bit late getting to lunch. We're going to try and start back as close to time as we can. After lunch, we've got a really good session by Vertiv, our customer, on how to effectively scale your marketing, uh, channel marketing. So please come back. Ignore Jared when he says that it's a bad time to be a CMO. It's actually a really good time.